is many's a gay night from dark till daylight I spend with people of high renown but in all their grandeur and hips to squander my heart would wander for sweet home town. Once again, a very good evening to you. If you've just joined us, you're listening to Sweet Home Town Internet Radio. And I hopefully am joined by my colleague in crime, Declan Ford. Are you there? I am oh. here, yes, yes. Technology never start. lets us down, never lets us down. Of people well, only I've, hmm? I've nowhere to go. <laughs> That's right. Hey, you know, when, you, when you're in your friends, you say, well, what sort of day had you? Oh, all right, sitting in the house here, same as myself. And then the conversation peters out after that. That's right. But, uh, but just a long, meaningful silence. It's we, like a Swedish film. <laughs> we sit and talk rubbish until they to each other. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, sure. Anyway. But this is the truth now. Yeah. Uh, I had mentioned maybe in an earlier uh, handover to you that I'd love to, to unearth a collection of tapes by the late, great Bill Heaney. Do you remember him? Oh, yes. Yes. Right, now, he, gentleman, he, he was always a lifetime in, in the bread industry, and he, he talked about that, but what really struck me was that he, 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 he during the interview, he, sent, he said he lost his horse that was confiscated from him in Ballygally. They were heading off in a cloyer somewhere, and uh, the powers that be pulled him in in Ballygally and took the horse off him, and it was, was confiscated for for the war effort. That's obviously That's right, the part of it. for the yeah. war, mm. that's right. And then I seem to remember, did, did he talk about the kind of uh, horse fair in Ballygally or where the, the, the horses would be bought? Yes, I think he had to borrow a horse or something uh, to get... Before to get the, the First World War? Yeah, I think he had to borrow a cob or something like that to get, get himself sorted to get to get, get the whatever he's taken back to, to wherever they came. They came from, must be near Kilnahiri or down the Ballygally Road somewhere. Right. And then he moved to Doma, um, and then he, he would have been involved maybe one of the sort of first bread dispatchers round. Uh, so we'll not spoil the tape. That's pretty much what it's about, Declan. So, but it's yeah. the fact that it's uh, that's 1914, 1915. You know, we're 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 well back there, aren't we now? You know, to well, someone you know, memory. It is strange. I, I remember uh, a number of years ago going to to see the play War Horse with the great puppetry based on the Michael Morpurgo book was made into a film by, by Steven Spielberg. Yeah. But to see it on the stage, you know, the the, the, the puppetry and the, the, the life-size horses, and then, you know, to, to have talked to somebody like Bill Heaney about yes. that, you know, mm-hmm. whose memory was as sharp, and the way that he could just conjure up the picture of, of, of what life was like in Tyrone uh, during the First World War. Mm-hmm. It was a, just an amazing story to tell. Like so many of our guests, they all, they always say, "What what what could I tell you, or what 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 would you want to talk to me for?" You know, and then when you look back years later, you realise that everybody had a wonderful story to tell. The fact that they were there and, and experienced that, and then obviously up through the Second World War as well. Um, certainly, uh, they're, they're lovely preservation to have, and uh, there seems to be no end them. Declan, I hate to tell you, uh, if this well, you know, <laughs> it brings history to life. Because history is all about people. Well, maybe it's about events and places, but in the main, it's about people. And you, once you get people talking about their lives, and as you said, you realise that everybody has a story to tell. Mm-hmm. It is. And, you know, the thing is, I suppose, at the end of the day, it's, we, we keep saying this like parts. You know, it, it's nice to look there and nice to think about it, but it's not the place to live. So sometimes I, I always add up that warning, I suppose, to just to say mm-hmm. to people, look, you know, because I think sometimes people can get get caught up in the past and think it's it's better than what it was. It is as it is, and it was as it was then too. And I suppose you know you have to be very mindful that whatever you look at the past, you do it today. And whenever you think about tomorrow, you still do it today. So today is really the only day, and these days are challenging for us all. But uh, it certainly is a it's a wonderful thing to look at. It's like opening an old photograph album or something that you hadn't seen for many years, and to hear voices and places and people reminisce yeah, that, that yeah. you can connect with us. Yeah, it's but it, 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 don't wear those rose tinted spectacles. No, no. Better to, to just to see it as it is, you know. And uh, and I think today's presentation actually is just is a lovely story, you know, about Oma at a certain time in the twentieth century. And a man with a, a, a job 
that is now a thing of the past. Yes, isn't it? And you know, those days the runs were were being sort of carved up and, and set out, and you know, and I suppose you had a question of their, their viability. I suppose sometimes if they're heading off to rural wee villages like Newton Stewart and Gorton and Plumbridge and things, the country houses that normally made their own bread, I'd imagine it was not an easy thing to to persuade people to come and and, and pay somebody regularly for 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 loaf of bread at the time. I'd imagine it would have been a bit of a challenge. Yeah. And it, well, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. To hear, I haven't heard it in years. No. So without further ado, we'll join the late Bill Heaney. And uh, once again, thank you for your contributions and thank you for your continuous support And over, over the weeks and months ahead. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll bring as much as we can to you. Declan, take care of yourself. To talk to you again soon. And uh, thanks okay, again. Okay, all the best. Bye. Uh, well, we were the last house in the parish of Vaskara, but we were on the march with Garibay. And you were and born there? Aye, uh, Kilnahiri. And then when did you leave Kilnahiri? 1916, to Fenton out to Drafton. Road, about uh, half a mile out of the south of the village. I was there till, I'll tell you this, I had a bad turn with a bad leg of osteomyelitis. And it was a couple of years completely off my feet. When I mended that, I wasn't put to do the farm work. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, I'll out and look for other work. You know, the, the problem was with me, I couldn't walk on uh, loose ground. But I could go ahead on a hard ground. You know, on a road, or that was all right. So I went to Belfast and I went on the transport lorry. In Belfast, and part of the the lorry work was in Coleillon, Nongannon, Stewartstown, and I had a big contract with Craig's Mill and Killery, and I was going to the Mill and Killery. I was getting on all right in that job, you know, but then I took appendicitis, and when I took appendicitis, I had to go into a hospital. I was, I was operated on the Mother Hospital. Got all rid of it, but I was no longer fit for the job because it was all 200 with bikes, you see. And then I went to Keyes, and I got started in Keyes, and I was a period work on Belfast, but my men were spare man for two or three years, <coughs> going all over the, wherever there was sickness or holidays or so and so, you know. After that, I went on a permanent run to learn to learn in Carnock. And I was on that for quite a time, couple, a couple of years. And I was speaking to the boss one time and I told him that there was a permanent country run that I was prepared to pull out of the city and go to it. And this uh, run that I come to, I know by the late Paddy Muldoon, he, he was a, from Newton Stewart. He died and I took over. And I've been working on the red pan till I was 65. And then when I was 65, I went in this store man here because I built a new depot down there, Dairy Road. And I stayed working on it till I was 77 years of age. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the whole story. <laughs> well, when, when did you come back to Roma then? Can you remember what year that was? 1940. 1940? Yeah. That was then in the... The war, of course, had, had started, and you must have seen a lot of changes. Oh, in I, you see, the war broke out when we, when I was still in Kilnahiri before we flooded the draft in nineteen fourteen, and then it went on to nineteen and eighteen. But then there was the bombing of Belfast and and all that sort of thing. Now the, the bombing, I think it was, in, I think it was in twenty one, that the bombing was done in Belfast. But it was very shortly after that that I went to Belfast. And as I say, it was on the transport, but then from that I went on in the Redmond and, and transferred then down to Oma. Well, that, so you that. lived in Belfast for about 20 years then? I was, um, well, I was over 11. <laughs> now, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't be exact about the, the dates, you know, or, or I never kept them. <laughs> I just went from one job to the other as, as it suited. Well, I was uh, I was quite fit for, as I tell you, for the, the transport 
to the trickle penetrators, but then you see it will be months after that before you could take on again. And I had to get work. <laughs> so in, instead of waiting on that, uh, I went to Kieser's and was fortunate enough to get started there. Well, it was it was only a matter of delivering bread. It was Barney Hughes. Barney Hughes. On his old bakery van, as the, no, the song said. Well, then, I was round the whole place. I was in Donegal. I was in Monaghan. And I'd done the whole six counties. And so they'd all passed as a spare man. So I didn't cover it all. But then, that was before I was permanent on the learn run, you know. So it left me in touch with a lot of, a lot of the country right enough. Well, did you... Want to move back to Oma, or was it just that it happened no, to vacancy uh, in Oma? I would have took it anywhere if it was, um, but it happened to turn up in Oma, you know. When I mentioned it to the boss, there was no talk of it, no expectations at that time. But then it was, uh, it might have been three or four months till after that. The Paddy was taken to the Royal Victoria Hospital and he died in the hospital. Mm. So then he come to me and he says, you're looking for a transfer to the country. So I said, that is right. Oh, I had I asked for it. And he says, what about this one? He says, Muldoon's on an Oma. And I said, oh, all right. But he says, there's a problem in it, I must tell you. And then I said, hey, what is it? He says, this one, he was on nearly 20 years. And he says, when he went on the barn, he says, he was going from town to town and all over the place and there was very few vans working in the area. And he scattered the run he was doing Oma, from Quinn, Castle Derg, Newton Stewart, Plumbridge and Gordon. Well, that was all right in the early days. But then whenever the other firm started to put vans on the road, you were doing the mileage, do you see, but you were only doing a third of the delivery or less because you could only get them a day in the week or something like that, you know, well, it was no service. And he says, what I want you to do, he says, you have been on, putting on bonds anyway. <laughs> so I did, you see, when I was on a spare. He says, I want you to divide the bond, he says, and there's a chap working with Muldoon McCannie. And he says, he knows, he's been on, and he says, with him for long enough, he knows the whole place. But he says, I want you to divide the van, he says, and put it in shape, the, you know. Because he says, it's really not fair, he says, it's miles and miles and miles of driving, no delivery, or not worthwhile deliveries, you know. But right enough, it was down to the alley of selling, or all the week before I took it over, it was 40 quid, and doing all them tunes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so... <coughs> McConney and I talked it over. He was right down in Kempsey uh, Avenue. And the whole family was here. His father was a, a nurse in the mental. And, but the whole family was in the, in the town. And I says to him, uh, you know, this has to be the vid. And I says, have you made up your mind what would be your choice? So it's no difference to me. I have no place to live in this town. I'm only come down on the train and I have to look for a place to settle when I come here. And I says, well, we'll go with the run, the two of us together. Right enough, <laughs> we did. We were down the first day and I went out with him, and then the next day I come up and they had no bike. Say, what, what, where's the bike? And I says, see, sir, I thought you were going to take over. I said, hey, go back and get it. I said, hey, the whole thing's yours till we talk it over and, and get the thing straightened out agreeable between us. So we went and of course we had plenty of time to talk all day <laughs> for a week. <laughs> and the soldier died. He wanted to do Uma because he lived in Uma. And that was perfectly all right. Then it was a matter of dividing the rest of it. Well I took on Drum Quinn, Castle Derg and Newton Stewart. And he took on Oma, Plumbridge, and Gordon. And of course, anything, it was, it was open to him because he had to go through Newton Stewart to get into the room. It was open to him if he could get anything in Newton Stewart on his way, take it. It was open, you know. It was very, it was agreeable. 
And he, ad he adopted it right away. So, well then, he got married here and he went to New Zealand. He went to the Oh, for only three or four years and when he died, there was a tumour in the brain. And then the grand chap he was, was very agreeable, no, no problem. And then you, took, you did the whole run then yourself then, or what, what happened? No, there? no, well, whenever he went away then they put another man in his place. Oh no, <laughs> see that it was, when they put his bike in the spoils if I had to, I couldn't do it. <laughs> anyway, I did take over it and i tell you the truth, all, all of us selling on it according to the books was 18 pounds in a week. Well, it went on all right. And the van got that big that the manager uh, out of Brazil, you know, he was a head checker in it. He says, look here, he says, you need to go down to Oma and see about that barn. He says, there's, it's selling far too much bread, he says, in that border area. And he says, I, I think you should go down and see and, and try and, uh, for fear anything would happen, you know. Well, Jack says, look here. That man's 40 years of age, and if he's not for to look after himself. <laughs> so, anyway, it went on ahead, and finally, I had to apply to him to take Castle Dairy off me altogether, because uh, the Castle Dairy grown, and I went from here, and I went down through Dragish, you know, and that way, that barn skirt, you know. Bypass Barnscourt, but went on into Castle Dairy that road. Well, then I come back out through the wrong one. You know, and made the run a, a steeple that you were walking from your left home to you got, to you got back home. And it did work out because at that time my bread was 1970 for two loaves. Well, I was over a hundred quid. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And then on account of me hitting the border, I was hitting the border. I turned it to Michael Hill's way down in Mullifer Moor and McCrory's and Mickey Meehan's shops. And all you had to do was go in the front door and make a Mike and South and go down the room and get the bike one day and you're on the priest's date. <laughs> <laughs> and another brother of his, Meehan's, he was on the border too, on another old back road, but saw the bike by roads, you know, and there's no, it all leads you into the mountains, and there's no main roads goes through that area at all, and uh, there was no board there, only a big post set up in the middle of the road, and at the gate of the house, and if you went by that, you were in the state. <laughs> you weren't stopped at all there, was <laughs> So, you turned in the street and come back, but the Emmons was on the border, and you see, when I work on one, the state was mad for bread. And, uh, it was it was it was a hell of a job trying to get round and get enough to go round them to come home and get home, you know. And it was the days of the blackout. No lights. That the, the headlights was blended down to the brunt of a table knife, and over that there was a flange. It only threw it only threw the light down the road about four or five yards. You know, uh, it was it was it was it was awful working right enough. You know, well I've generally been and uh, when I lived in the town, sat down half new or I for a short time. Then I got a wee farm out in Faria. And I moved out to it. Well, where so I used to take the youngsters into school, coming in, but not all the time because there was other times. I had to be in at eight o'clock, and like that would be, they had been shut out, and when you brought them in, the school wouldn't be opened, you know, you couldn't couldn't do that. But um, on then during the war years, when I was got a wee bit bigger, they were coming into other school, and they were walking into the hut right enough, but they had to stay in the town. Till I come back at night to take them home. Uh, my father and mother lived round there in John Street, and they come out of school and went into hut and stayed there to whatever time I was coming home, and I come home through the town and left them and brought them home because they weren't safe on the road, 
And it was the time the American army was here, and they were the devil. God forgive me. <laughs> I hope that's not recorded. <laughs> so it was a long day, from early in the morning to... Oh, it was a long day. Maybe six. It was a long day, and there was a little money for it as far as that goes, because uh, the wages were meant oh, for a long, long time. Until the, uh, we got no increase in wages till the... We had a, a sheet of coupons, and there was a man the name of McGuinness, and he was, um, uh, what did his office be in the northern government? But he gave us a raise of 15 shillings a week to cope with the coupons. That was the first increase we got. But then, <coughs> whenever the coupon business was over, the, you know, the prices started to go up, 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 and wrote and let us know that they weren't going to take this, uh, <laughs> this money off us again. <laughs> and that was the first raise of pay we got when the war was over. Or, I mean to say, when the, when the ration come in. Fifteen shillings. Fifteen shillings. And the wages was uh, only 2.5. The rest of it, you had it earned on profit on sales or commission. But yeah, well, then, uh, you know, the terms of commission was <coughs> there was a standard on the van, and you got there were no money paid except this basic wage to, to you and beyond the standard. Well, then, whenever you went beyond the standard, uh, £20, £20 pound a week beyond the standard, you got, I think it was four months, you got of an increase, like a, a commission. And finally it went on and I finished till yeah, actually you got a shilling, but there's a, as I say, the standard went up, you know. Uh, well, then, uh, nowadays that's completely done away with, the whole system's done away with. And the men's practically all agents. They're not employees of the firm at all. They're driving whatever firm they're driving for, but they're actually agents. And it was Hughes's farm that you drove? It was drove Hughes's, aye. Well then, did their bread come down from Belfast? Always, aye, oh aye. And you, you would have to get it then at the... At the railway station. The railway station. You see, but their trains were always rolling then. Well then, of course, once the trains went off, the, they had to build a depot down the dairy road, and it was delivered then the lorry at night. Come, come over at night, and it was... They had keys for to let themselves in and out, and... When you went down in the morning, and your uh, kind of it was put in containers, each man's containers, whatever it was all separate, you know. And you looked for the container, your containers, wheeled it out, loaded it, and uh, checked it, and away you went. <laughs> that was it. Well, then uh, on your bread run, what kind of can you remember any of the products that you would sell? The the kinds of bread. Oh, I was a whole. You had a. I could have been 40 or 50 different items on an order sheet. And some of them you mightn't want it very many, you know. And, and others would be the main part of your load. But uh, you had to order it four days in advance. For instance, Thursday's bread that had to be in the post on Monday. And so on. And then you delivered. To shops and to houses? Both. To both? both. Where, where would you say the bulk of your, your trade would come from? Is it from the houses? Oh, mine would have come from the houses eventually. Uh, it uh, really would. But it would be nearly a 50 50 job, you know. Of course, it did. Uh, I don't know. All the shops in Drumquan and had a good trade in Drumquan. Never had any good grip on Newton Stewart. But I done well in Castle Derg because I'd, I went to Castle Derg two days of the week and I had to get the bread delivered by transport two other days. So it was, um, I'd, I'd, and that was all shop delivery now, of course, because the transport, it was in hampers and that's, uh, they took it out and threw off the hamper. Yes, and that was, that was it. But uh, it was charged to me. So on, but it did right now. So it worked out, but there were no doubt about it. It was long hours and hard work. And what about the customers? How did you get on with them? The best. 
No bother at all. <laughs> Out of a face, all, like I mean to say, <coughs> I work in the drum queen area, well, the big lot of the drum queen area, I would say to a great extent, would be Catholic people, you know. But there is, there's places where it was all Protestant. And the Protestant people bought the bread of me, the identical, same as the Catholics, and I served even the minister's house. <laughs> so, so I have no crew to pluck with them, no. The bread was a great leveller. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> needed it. <laughs> well, well, then, uh, uh, say when you're dealing with, with families and that, did you find that um, they would pay each week, or how did you operate that? Did you? Uh, uh, <laughs> You had to carry a lot of it. Take, for instance, a, a, a shop there at Masterson's in Gesselderg. And I used to never go to look for the money. To, I thought I would, the cheque was big enough to pay for a week's bread. And what happened there? He owed me £70 when he got a stroke and died. And it was 13 months after the fool about the 70 pounds from a solicitor in Castle Day and Starbuck. And what about the ordinary houses, the ordinary people? Oh, generally speaking, no complaints now. There was people surely that owed money and it wasn't their own fault. And I could easily forgive them because they knew for a fact. But I had others, and again they were in difficulties. And for instance, when I was driving to Larne, there was a schoolmaster and he went on the drunk. And then he got out of his job over the head of it and he owed me £20. And he went to New Zealand. And £20 was a good amount of money when the bread was only four pence sitting in out of money for a loaf. <laughs> But, <clears throat> he came back to work, and the next thing I got was a letter from, it might have been, oh, maybe, into the two years, <laughs> he was gone. But I got a letter from him, or to send him on the account. And I got a cheque for it from New Zealand, the last penny of it. Now I had another case of, on a, uh, and it was two sisters, and one of them had, was married, but the husband, he worked all his days in Scotland, and he sent the money to them from Scotland. But whatever happened to him, he died. And then that left him living here without anything at all. And they owed me, I can't mean exactly, but it really mean a matter between four and five pounds. You know, <coughs> but then they went to Scotland, the two sisters and the two children, two youngsters. And over in Scotland, oh, again, maybe a year or a year and a half. And I got a letter from the young fellow to send on the account. And they turned round and they paid that last penny of it, week by week, till the pays off. So, like I mean to say, those <laughs> you know, times were hard and tough. Oh, but, uh, the worst people living, living, I don't know how they lived, to tell you the truth. I really don't know how they lived or existed at all. You know, you, you covered a fair bit of County Tyrone. Did you see much poverty on, on the way around in the different houses and the different towns and villages? Uh, well, there were nobody wealthy, but most of them was for a break even. You know what I mean? But the other people now, they were in difficulties from time to time. And the bulk of them, if you helped them along at that time, they'd come back. they come back. And even when I come off the pond and another man went on to it after I was finished with it, they give the money to the other man and send it home for me. Now that's the truth, see. Well then, uh, along with the bread and that, did you deliver papers or any other I was only whatever papers was ordered, certainly I had, I had a couple of dozen hurls and a couple of dozen accounts to bring out, and I had one Donegal paper, 
It was printed in the Herald here. But that's, uh, that was only eight, that was only the only paper I'd say they called in the Herald to a great extent. Uh, none of the daily papers. The Irish News, is there? Oh, no, you see, <coughs> the, you weren't, uh, there might be houses you were at every day in the early stages of the run, but the bulk of the houses you'd only been at them twice a week. So you couldn't deliver a daily paper, you know. Well then, did you say that your your, your parents lived in John Street? Aye. What, did they move here or were they...? Oh aye, they sold out. The, was, we were, the family was all away and they sold Drafton. Right, and they, they come down and lived there and then the, opened a drapery shop there. In, in John Street? In John Street. Can it's you near where Tom Wilson lives. Mm-hmm. That's the house. And uh, they were they were there as I say when I they were down they were there and set up before I come to Oma. They were only tenants in that house. My mother named McKenna from down by Kappa owned owned it. Then the, the sister she bought, she actually bought this this house, and I had a house across the road for Cunningham's as now, and it was a smaller house. Well then, the father and mother died, the two girls were married, and this house was too big an outfit for the, the, other two, the two sisters, you know, for to take over. And then they come at me to buy this of them, and they, they would take over mine. Well, w- was part of this house a, a, a dentist's practice? That was his son. Oh, right, and he had the premises then? When he come out, finished, <coughs> uh, him and I was talking it over, and as I say, and as, uh, I had rearranged I had this building and all that done, you know. And he took that front section. Now that amounts to a sitting room or a waiting room. And he had two surgeries, a place for dark room and a place for locked up for keeping poison. <laughs> Medicine <laughs> place, you know. So that was on that flat, and then on the stores, just straight across there, there's a bathroom or a toilet, you see, and that left had that part of the house covered for for Latin, and then when we closed the shop, as you see, it was Kathleen was in the shop when she retired from the shop, we rigged up the shop, and it has been let since. In fact, it was. The bank was on it. What do you call the bank around John Street? That was on it, on it for a year while they were doing it. So renovating up in, in the John Street? Bank. And then there's another crowd of people coming to it now. Wonder people. This plastic or what do you call these new wonders? Or PVC. 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 Well, I mean, it's a huge house. Plenty of space. Oh, it's a big house. Right? Well, the hard house to heat. Well, that's what we're just thinking about at the present time, putting in uh, uh, central heating part of it. Because that would be this room, the kitchen, the bathroom, and the bedroom. Uh, that would be all in this flat. Well, then there's three bedrooms and the big main room up on the next flat up above. Well, that's all we would be putting heating into. You know, we wouldn't be doing the wouldn't be doing the shop section. That's the ground floor. No, we wouldn't be doing the part of the front of the house here that's let. No, we wouldn't be doing the attic. And the attic <laughs> is the same size of a flat as the one you're sitting in. Then it's it's all it's wired and electric lighting and stairs is good and all the rest of it. But the same, it's um, it's like a house this size is not a house for two or three people. It's very much a family home and... Uh, you need to give every, uh, give every one of them a section to look after it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's a great vantage point for the for the activity in Oma. Oh, right. It is. A, you know. it's, a, it's, a, it's well situated that way now. It's very convenient. You're in the centre of the town. You're near the post office. The banks is beside you. The churches, whatever you belong to, they're beside you. And the schools is beside you. So now, what more could you, what better could you want? It's very hard to get that anywhere else.
Well, what was that story? We were going to Achnaclai Market with a load of grass seed. And we had a, it was a big, big, big clean boned horse, but it was a very big horse, you know. Not, not a, a real heavy type, but a, a big, powerful horse, just the same. And we had this load of bags, uh, on, and it was on a flat. We had got a loan of the couch from Owen McCarl of the Broad Road. Owen McCarl was from McCann's as now, you know. And we got a loan of this flat cart for to build this load on it anyway. And we were going up Balagoli Street with a load when out comes the army. Stopped us on the street horse. So we're still at poor mile to go, you know, from Balagoli into Alan McLeod with the market. However, they demanded the horse and that was that. And we got the loan of the horse, <laughs> our own horse, <laughs> for to take the load on until uh, Alan McLeod and get rid of the grass seed and back. But the cart was in Balagoli and the horse was gone. And it happened fortunate enough to be a a Balagoli fair day, and there was a man the name of Joe Davison, and he dealt in horses. And God won't be fortunate enough for to get one of these cob horses of his alone, but he took about a job getting the, getting the harness and getting him into the dray cart. <laughs> but anyway, he took the cart home for us, <laughs> and we had no horse there. And then he had to turn round and he, he, the, the army picked up anything between five, uh, like five year old horses from that on, uh, as long as they were big, able bodied horses, you know. Well, you just lost them. That was that. But now the moment they bought that horse, of course, that horse was 20 years of age. And they gave us a price for them, like you're in the selling them for shillings, if you know what I mean. And you mean went out to the stable some morning, they couldn't get up. At, uh, after that age, but he was, <laughs> he didn't look like that, you know, <laughs> but that's a fact. And he bought then uh, one common three-year-old, untrained, and then he bought a six-quarter oil, untrained. And God knows, I walked backwards and I'm ploughing for miles. I had to lead the two horses to keep the one on the floor and the other in his place down the field and back up the field and because she had to walk backwards for to lead, lead the two horses. You couldn't get between them, you know, for there's not no room between them. And a plough because uh, you know the way they have to go. So you had to, there was nothing for it but to take them by the head and walk backwards. Well, eventually the, the older horse got to, to be a, a, a terrible good trained worker. And then it, uh, it was great because she I kind of controlled the young one. And well, it was an awful job getting the crop in and all that sort of thing. You couldn't have followed a nicer team of horses when they, when they, when they finish up. It was, uh, and f for, three, for three years after that, we'd done the same thing. We bought, bought a horse every year, trained the horse, sold him, and so on. That went on for the June of war. And it was, it was very late in the summertime, like, because for a number of visitors, there used to be an awful amount of Scottish people come to learn in the, in Glenarm, you know. And the, the slip in the fields and all over the place, it wasn't a question of all being housed. But, uh, and uh, it was great. And uh, it was powerful up to the year 1932. And in 1932, the year of the Congress in Dublin, was in the riot and learn with the people going to the, taking the train, or not the train, but the boat, for to go around to Dublin. And a lot of went into the coal yard and started to clod the coal off the wagons of them walking the streets below. And, and do you know, it closed the town. I had a wagon of bread, a railway wagon of bread sitting in the railway station and they weren't a soul in the town. Oh, the whole thing, the, there was a, the convent for instance, had to go in the uh, girls and, uh, for a fortnight and they'd done a week's retreat 
and a week's holidays. And they had just paid for the paid it annually into the firms they were working for, do you see? And then the firms they were working for paid them off the come. The money holiday was paid for. But the whole thing was cancelled. And McNeil's now there, the sheriff banks on the road and had three hotels down there. I wonder so about the money, the yard man. It just absolutely paralyzed the place. And as I say, I come in and tell the manager, should I look I go back in the bread sitting in, in Lauren Station? I says, cancel any orders I have in till I see what, I'm, what I can do. Yeah, but uh, 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 one way or another I got rid of it. But there was three or four days I had no orders in. I was selling uh, out of stock. <laughs> that happened, surely. Between Lern and Ballymena, and I went up the back of it, the Glen Arm side of it, you know, and then I come out over the hip of the mountain and out and, and uh, Bally Newer side of it. And <coughs> as I say, it was a warm, warm night, but it was, was kind of dark, but like in a summer night, it's never what you'd call dark. But it was coming up the hill between Robus and Secure and, and, and the top of the hill. I was claiming at the time. And something appeared in the road and I left when the brakes and stopped her and God I says, what's wrong with me? There was nothing. Absolutely nothing. At all. And she so said, that is very strange. It must be a warning of some kind. I never the like of that never happened to me before. I come over the hill, and as soon as I come over the hill, there was four horses lying on the road. They had come down, you see, the, the, the mountain comes alive with creepers in uh, and the, and the evenings, you know. And the horses come out and lay on the road for to be clear of it. And honest to God, when I come up over the hill, and I, was, I was even more than modest. Because I was, uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you why, but it scared the devil out of me. <coughs> and right enough, I had to get out and throw pebbles at the horses and put them off the road to get, to get on. There's <laughs> <laughs> many a gay night from dark till daylight. I spend with people of high renown. But in all their grandeur and hopes to squander, my heart would wander for sweet Oma Town.